Good morning, NeuroDivergent Nation. This is a NeuroDivergent Doctor. My favorite comment that I've had of the week is, I look like a non-coked up Donald Trump Jr. And I think that's because it looks like I've always got slick backed hair in my, uh, or gel in my hair. So today I kind of like brushed that out a little bit to make it not look so much. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. I'd probably go with no, but <laughs> maybe the non-coked out part is good. <laughs> anyway, my question to you is, are you a person who's always hot? Are you sweating profusely for seemingly no good reason? Do you strip down the moment you walk in the door and hope that your kid didn't bring some friend home that you didn't expect? Or maybe like I've been my whole life where you're constantly cold and you can't seem to heat up. What about forgetting to eat all day or being chronically dehydrated because you don't drink enough because you don't recognize that internal cue that tells you that you're thirsty? Are you one of those people who dresses wrong for the season, like shorts and t-shirts in 38 degree weather? It's right for you, but everybody else is like, why are you dressed like that? If you've answered hell yeah to any of these, you may be having difficulty with one of your senses, but which one? So you've heard of the five senses, you know, touch, taste, sight, hearing, and smell. And then there's our little sixth sense that our little friend Haley Joe Osmond taught us all about. He thought he saw dead people. No, I'm just kidding. That, that's not the real Sixth Sense. Well, it is the name of the movie, The Sixth Sense, and I hope I didn't spoil that for anybody. But the real Sixth Sense is actually what's called our vestibular sense, which is all about balance and posture. But this video isn't about senses one through six. It's not even about our seventh sense. I know this is like starting to sound like a Fast and Furious franchise, like F-19, the fasterest and the furiouserest. Outer space will never be the same. <laughs> I'm tired of these two, believe me. But real quick though, our seventh sense, before I move on to the eighth sense, our seventh sense is proprioception, which is our ability to know where our body and our body parts are in the space around us. This is something I spend time with my clients talking about after diagnosis of autism. Someone who struggles with proprioception might constantly be bumping into things, have lots of bruises, they don't even know where they came from, and difficulty knowing where their body parts are relative to their other body parts. So think tripping over your own feet or smacking your hip with your own arm. That's not what this video is about either. I know, get to the point already, right? But I will record a video on the seventh sense later. But today I wanted to talk about the eighth sense, which is interoception and the problems a lot of our neurodivergent nation deals with. Basically, interoception is a person's conscious or non-conscious sense or awareness of what is going on inside their body. Interoception problems are not only having to do with things that I talked about at first, like body temperature regulation problems, not recognizing hunger, thirst, etc., but they might also include issues like bladder control problems, extreme fatigue, difficulty properly interpreting emotions, and getting hurt or burned without noticing right away. And these are just a few examples, but that's not all. Check this out. It also has a hand in controlling your autonomic motor system, which is breathing, intestinal function, blinking, heart rate, eye dilation, and more. No, 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 I'm not done yet. Guess what? This is also the main mechanism for our fight or flight response system. So let that percolate in your mind just for a moment. Just process this. This is the main mechanism for our fight or flight response system. If you're having interoception problems, you're likely having problems controlling some or all of these functions I just mentioned. And you may be in states of panic and anxiety more often. And this may make you stand out to others, preventing you from going out in public places with confidence and ease. And it may play a role in so many other things that are common traits of autism. Wow. I mean, who knew so many issues could be tied to this one sense that never really gets talked about. Okay, so let's break this down into bite-sized chunks. You know this is what I like to do. You see, we have sensory receptors throughout our body, in our muscles, in our skin, in our joints, even in our bones. And 90% of these are what is called free nerve endings, located in the outer flesh and skin. These pick up on sensations and send signals to our brain about them, and in turn, our brain figures out how to regulate many of our organs and functions, which keep us in a state of homeostasis, which is just a fancy word for balance within the body. Homeostasis helps us prepare ourselves for the day and helps us interact well with others. So for this video, we will call our body's attempts to prepare for homeostasis, Preparation H. Yeah, Air Doctor, it's a really good plan. Yes, Frau, on the whole, I think Preparation H feels good. Please, please, 
for the love of good, somebody comment and finish this bit for me, please. <laughs> Dr. Evil. Anyway, when a person has some challenges with their eighth sense, they can experience lower self-awareness, difficulty problem solving. Sounds like ADHD too, doesn't it? Challenges with looking at other people's perspectives, social understanding problems, cognitive inflexibility, trouble deciphering where feelings of empathy are coming from, and emotional recognition and regulation problems. A person might experience a rapid heart rate at inappropriate times. They might have heavy breathing at inappropriate times which can be kind of awkward. <laughs> and wetting the bed at inappropriate times. Actually, this is a really huge problem for a lot of people and I've worked with them in the past about this. On a personal note, and I'm being totally serious about this, I wet the bed until the age of 12 and I couldn't figure out why in the hell that was happening. No matter what strategy I used, even that little alarm bell thingy on my bed, it didn't work. It sucked, it was humiliating. I got, it got in the way of my social life where I typically couldn't sleep over at friends' houses and it was a way for my a-hole cousin to poke fun at me. F you, Ezekiel. Anyway, so what's the deal with autistic individuals and interoception? Why do so many have a problem with this and how does it affect them? Why are some struggling with less while others experience more of it? Isn't that just like autism though? Just when you think you've figured something out, half of the autistic people out there they experience something different, just the opposite sometimes. That's one of the reasons it's so tough for neurotypical people to study autism and draw conclusions. Autism is a huge multidimensional phenomenon and our understanding of it is just in its infancy. Another part about research on this subject of interoception is that it draws correlations fairly well, which means it's been identified that many autistic people experience diminished interoception, but they don't necessarily know why they experience it more often than the general population. There's also research that suggests that interoceptive awareness can actually be heightened when depression and anxiety are present. This means some autistic individuals who experience anxiety or depression or both may actually feel their internal cues more, which causes completely different types of problems. Now, let's talk about body temperature and regulation for a moment. Because this seemed to be a very common trait within our neurodiverse nation, when I put this on social media, it's something I think needs a lot more attention. Temperature regulation is supposed to be automatic and it's supposed to change slightly depending on the ambient temperature around us. The temperature of the body is mostly regulated by information passed back and forth between the hypothalamus part of the brain and the skin. When your body is exposed to different temperatures, your body is using this system. It's supposed to balance your internal body temperature with temperatures outside of you. When the hypothalamus is unable to do its job effectively, then your body can overheat or be too chilled. Many autistic individuals have trouble with this because their body and brain are having a hard time picking up on that information. I'm talking about the information between the hypothalamus part of the brain and the skin. And as a result, they can experience higher or lower core body temperatures. This is usually associated with sensory processing issues, but as you see, this flavor of interoception plays a big role in autism. Autistic people may constantly run hot or cold or may not feel pain as much or can't tell when they're fatigued because their body's not processing that information well. It can also give the wrong sensations such as numbness or itching instead of pain or vice versa. A simple bug bite that itches can cause pain for some and this can be very confusing to an autistic individual especially as a child. So think about this for a second. When an autistic child is learning to label their feelings, so you're just a young one, you're learning what this feeling is and people are putting labels on it for you, emotions, sensations, all those things, they're trying to figure out how their body works based on their experience and what adults are telling them. And if they are experiencing pain instead of itch or tickle instead of pain, it might not match up with what the adults are telling them that they're experiencing. And that can be both confusing and frustrating for everyone. So it won't be until they're older that they figure these things out, like the difference between pain and a tickle or the slight breeze on the back of the neck for most people is refreshing, but it causes pain in them. Parents have to really work hard to be aware of what their child is emoting and saying and should be constantly assessing whether it matches up to what they're being told by adults. If they feel pain with being exposed to cold, don't tell them they're feeling something different. Really try hard to figure this one out with them and correctly label what they're feeling. 
Now let's talk about emotions. Maybe you're one of the ones who can really feel emotions well. Anxiety, for example, it's usually pretty easy to recognize because it has a host of physical reactions that accompany it, such as having pupils dilated, increased uh, breathing, muscle tension, and sweating. Some people say they get a gut feeling from certain people that warn them that the person's going to harm them or take advantage of them. They say that it feels like an uneasy feeling and usually point to this area, the stomach and the chest area. For those who struggle with interoception, they may not associate those sensations with anxiety or distrust, and they may not really associate it with any labeled feeling or emotion, and as a result, they may find themselves in really tough situations. I often hear autistic individuals complain that everyone accuses them of being angry all the time. But how frustrating might it be to be in a body that's constantly providing not enough or too much feedback for the situation that they're in? They might not be aware of their facial expressions, their vocal tone, their volume, and their stance. They may appear to be angry from the onlooker's perspective and experience. But think about this. If you're constantly being told that you're angry, wouldn't that actually begin to really make you angry? I mean, honestly. Anyway, my point is, a lot of individuals, they may misinterpret their sensations or they may not feel them at all. One of the big downsides to this is when a person is experiencing something inside and does not respond to it in a way that helps them deal with it. It can build and build and build, adding to other sensory issues that they might be having, adding to the stress associated with being autistic in a dysfunctional world, adding to the physical and emotional problems that come with sleep problems and work stressors and yada, yada, yada. Add these up and we have all the makings for a blow up or a meltdown or a shutdown. Too many of those can result in an autistic burnout and you can check out my video on autistic burnout on here as well. I remember this one time. My wife was distracted while she was cooking and she pulled a pizza pan out of the oven while it was super piping hot and felt no pain. Conversely, when she gets sick, she has a hard time telling where she's feeling bad. She just knows she feels bad and she feels it very intensely. Now, as a caring husband, I try to communicate with her in the best way I know how to help her figure out what's going on and determine if she needs medical attention. But this can be difficult because most autistic people hate rapid fire questions or any questions at all. And my ADHD ASD ass just wants to ask questions while my brain goes into hyperfocus on the challenge of solving this medical mystery like I'm house MD or the good doctor or something like that. I need to have a personal time. No, another personal example, myself and two of my sons can go all day without eating and not even think about it. That's likely interoception hyposensitivity. All right, so if you've seen my videos, you know I like to provide hopefully helpful information on autism and ADHD that nobody else is providing because not only am I multiple levels of neurodivergent, but so is my wife and my family. But I'm also a doctor of clinical psychology and a clinician and a researcher and I test people for autism. But for me, telling people about this is great, but I also like to provide tips and help to people in hopes that it will help you in your neurodivergent life. And this video is no exception. So here are some ways that you can improve your interoceptive awareness so that you can improve your experience in life. Number one, there are no tests out there that I'm aware of that test interoception. There is a questionnaire that's intended to help you identify the degree of interoceptive awareness that you might have, and this is called the MAIA assessment. It's a short uh, assessment, and even though it was not normed on an autistic population, it might be pretty good at helping you determine where you are on this. I, along with my people at my clinic, completed the MAIA, but we were confused on how we compared to the general population that we presumed it was normed on. After scratching our heads for a while, I reached out to the clinic and was able to talk with the person who created this questionnaire. They said the tool has no norms, but he said that it's more for you to assess yourself by asking questions related to interoceptive awareness. So good news. The MAIA did just that. It was able to reflect on my experiences related to interoception, and that was helpful. So number one is check out the MAIA test if you want to. It's free, it's online, just Google it. Uh, number two, I'm a huge fan of mindfulness, which is another word for a type of meditation. 
What I'm talking about is choosing a part of your body, any part, and just wiggle that body part around while you focus on what it feels like. When you're done wiggling, just lay there and notice what that body part feels like. I love being mindful after a yoga pose or a workout. Wow, it's hot in here. Holy crap. This really works. It's easy, but don't let the simplicity of it throw you off. Try it out for a few minutes for a few days and see if it makes you feel different and more interoceptively aware. Number three, another way to practice some mindfulness is to get a notebook and write down what your body experienced during that mindfulness wiggling. Write down whatever you're feeling, what you felt like beforehand, what you felt like during and after. Writing it down forces you to make more accurate connections in your mind between the body and your cognition. Describe what you feel in as much detail as you can. Number four, biofeedback. Now, biofeedback is a therapeutic technique that uses technology like sensors that are attached to the body to provide visual information about various bodily functions such as heart rate, breathing, etc. It helps connect the brain and body. Researchers have posited that just 20 minutes of biofeedback drastically improve interoceptive accuracy in test subjects. Number five, brain stimulation. This is another technique that can improve interoception. This one can range from being minimally invasive to pretty damn invasive, depending on the type. It can also run on the expensive side and can be quite a time commitment, but do that as it may, various forms of brain stimulation have been shown to manipulate the brain's signal processing responsible for interoception. Number six, there's a book by Kelly Mahler called Interoception, The Eighth Sensory System. It gives details about how autistic individuals can improve body awareness. Kelly is a licensed occupational therapist, a researcher, and a professor, so it might be something to consider reading. Number seven, have you heard of a sensory diet? It's nothing to do with food, really. It's, it's a carefully designed set of sensory experiences that help a person learn body awareness. There are so many things you can do to learn about your own body and senses, such as sand play, hair brushing, exploring different textures on cloth, different foods, hot tub, cold showers, letting glue dry on the fingers and then peeling it off, vibrating things, weighted blankets, massages, etc. Number eight, and this just isn't for interoception. This is a skill I wanna to talk to you about that will serve you in every area of life. Number eight, now this is one that can actually be um, generalized to your entire life. Like this is, this is a very important skill. Teach your partner or loved ones who have a lot of contact with you the art of additive empathy. When you're having difficulty expressing your emotions or identifying your physical or mental state, someone skilled in additive empathy can make statements about what they feel might be going on with you. Here's an example. Let's say you're in the car and you're starting to breathe heavily and you start tugging or adjusting your clothing. Some people would say, what's wrong with you? Or are you okay? Or stop freaking out. Someone using additive empathy might make a statement such as, I'm getting the impression that you're hot and that that coat might feel restrictive. See, it doesn't have to be a question. Because what do most autistic friends I have say about being asked questions? Yeah, they don't like them. So additive empathy is often a statement. If you're wrong, generally they can correct you with what's going on, hopefully. Try looking up additive empathy. Maybe try it out on yourself. Uh, it's a great tool for effective communication, but you can help others learn it too. Help them help you, Jerry Maguire. <laughs> help me help you. Anyway, that's it for this episode. If you have something you'd like me to post a video on, subscribe and leave a comment or contact me through email. This is the Neurodivergent Doctor and I hope this helps you in your neurodiverse universe. <laughs> what is it now? No, nothing. You know what? I agree. Preparation H does feel good on the whole.